leader is, so we will move forward um, with a moment of, of prayer, and then we will again get the seven hundred doors closing. All right. That's the God that you come and just lead us in prayer. The Lord shall lead us not here, just open us up with prayer, and we'll go from there. God bless each and every one of you. So good to be here. Amen. The brother just told me it's just good to be seen. Amen. It's good to be here. God bless each and every one of you. And we pray that you are rejoicing in Jesus and continuing to trust in the Lord. Let us speak to God. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon each one of us. We pray tonight, God, that you will bless each candidate, that you will bless each listener, and God, that you will open up our hearts and minds to receive what Lord God comes from them. But God, we give you glory for Jesus, yes. and we just thank you, God, for just being alive, yes. for health, for portion of strength, yes. and God, a sound mind. Yes. The devil is busy, God, trying to rob us from praise. To rob us from, Lord God, worship. But God, we give you glory tonight. Yeah. We give you all praise because you're worthy. Yeah. And God, bless these candidates, God, yeah. that, that God have out there, putting their hands to the plot for the community. Give them strength, Lord God, to move forward in a positive way. Yeah. And God, even when the devil comes to attack them, yeah. Lord God, let them know that no weapon formed against them will prosper. But they will walk by faith and not by sight, leaning and depending on you. We love you tonight, we praise you tonight, and we adore you in Jesus' name. That God's children say amen. 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 Um, Pastor um, Worthy and uh, Kyle, we are set with uh, minutes already loaded, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, we want to entertain a motion to accept the minutes of the alliance from last month. So moved. Moved. Do you second? Second. Second. Uh, that we would accept the minutes as they have been posted. All in favor, let me know by the sign. Aye. Aye. Opposed have the same right. Eyes have it. It shall be recorded. All right. Um, we want to also entertain um, Pastor Harrison, and you will come and give us a report of our finances before we begin.
Our purpose is to educate our community on what is about to take place between now and November. Some of it is primary or those that don't have primary, we want to inform you of who they are, platforms that they are presenting, because if we're going to vote for folks, we need to know what they stand for. Amen. 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 So what we want to do tonight, we're, this is the beginning of a series of stuff we're going to do around um, understanding it so that still the number one um, person, persons that distribute, that disseminate information to communities still are pastors and our and our community leaders, so we want to make sure that the information is correct. So what we're going to do is allow all of the candidates to introduce themselves, um, tell us what they're running for, and then we will come back to the beginning of those folks and listen to a five or six minute presentation that shares what their platform is. When we complete that, then we will come back for a time of Q&A. And what we want to remember, let's talk about Q&A. Uh, let's talk about Q&A. Q&A means Q&A. Doesn't mean that you give your dissertation. Doesn't mean that we want to hear all that. You have a question for a candidate. You ask the question and then let the candidate respond. This is not hostile environment. This is still God's house. And we're going to conduct ourselves accordingly. Amen? Amen. Amen. So we want to make sure we stay in that order. And um, if if anyone is out of that order, we will we will stop you in the midst. Don't be don't be upset. Don't get all bent out of shape. Remember, Q and A means you ask the question, the candidate gets to respond. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's begin. We'll begin with we'll start on this end, and we'll work this way. Just first of all, y'all just tell us who you are. Tell us what um, position you are running for, and then we'll come back to the platform. All right. Can you hear me? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Evans. I am currently serving as a district attorney for District 8, which includes uh, Nash, Edgecombe, and Wilson County. I have filed for re-election. Uh, my election will take place in November. I will not be in the primary. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to the remainder of the evening. Hey, good evening. My name is Don Davis. I'm honored to serve um, currently in the North Carolina, North Carolina Senate District 5, uh, representing Pitt and Green County. I'm running right now for the 1st Congressional District um, of North Carolina. Uh, to represent us here in the East. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And to Rev. Reverend Worthy, I'm Jackson Chapel First Missionary Baptist Church, so we have a relationship from way back. Um, I am Representative Linda Cooper Suggs, Wilson, District 24. I was elected in 2020, uh, appointed by the governor, and then ran for election, I won. So therefore, it's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and I look forward forward to continuing our conversation. Thank you so much. Good evening. Uh, I'm Shelly Williams, and I represent District 23, which is all of Edgecombe County, uh, Martin County, and I just picked up uh, Bertie County, so I've been in those three counties. And I've been here representing probably for the last uh, eight, nine years. I don't have an opposition in the primary, but I do in the general election, and I'll be looking for you to vote, as always. Thank you. Good evening, sisters and brothers, men and women of God. My name is Erica Smith, and I am running to be the next congressperson for the 1st Congressional District. It was the honor of my life to serve you in Edgecombe when I represented you for two terms in the North Carolina State Senate and um, also other districts for three terms. Thank you so much, glad to be here. Good evening, my name is Candy Smith. I'm representing Pitt County, currently District 8 in the House, but I am running for the Senate seat, District 5, which will cover Edgecombe and Pitt County. It's an honor to be here. I'm Milton F. Toby Pitt. Presently serve as your senator until the lines were redrawn. A 
Find the redrawing of the lines, and I lost Acorn County, and I lost Halifax County. The district that I am running in is Field District 4, by number, uh, which is Wilson County, Wayne County, and Green County. I thank you for all the support that you've given me in the past. Uh, I don't, unless, is there anybody here from Wilson? Good evening, everyone. I'm Representative Raymond Smith, Jr. I currently represent House District 21, which is Wayne County and Sampson County. But due to redistricting, that district no longer exists. So I find myself in Senate District 4, uh, which is Wayne Green Wilson, and I am here tonight to present myself to some and introduce myself to others. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm James Gallier. I'm serving my second term in the North Carolina General Assembly, serving House District 25, which is 20, previously 20 of the 24 precincts in Nash County. With the redraw, it is now 23 of the 24 precincts in Nash County. We picked up four we did not have in the southern portion of the county, but we lost Sharpsburg. And so if there's anyone here from Sharpsburg precinct, that is now part of the Wilson uh, draw. I'm asking for your vote and your support as I seek my third term in the State House. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. We want to begin with hearing, um, we will hear from the congressional seat first, um, which is a um, seat that G.K. Butterfield has filled. And we have uh, two of those candidates here tonight. So um, we will say ladies first. How about that? We'll say ladies first. Sister Erica, Senator Erica, would you take five to six minutes to share with us your platform? I will I will lift my hand when your six minutes is up and um, and I would I would solicit that you would stop. If not, I'll tell Pastor Dr. Worthy to turn your microphone off. <laughs> Amen. All right, it's in your hands, Senator Erica. Thank you so much, Bishop Daniel and Pastor Worthy. This is not my first time here. And so I have preached here. It's good to be back with you, saints of God. And I will govern myself accordingly. So every Baptist preacher needs to set their timer because you know how we like to go on. So I will try to keep this under five minutes, but just let me share with you who I am and why I am running. I am Erica Smith. I'm a former three-term state senator. While in the state senate, I fought to raise the age uh, for our juveniles. North Carolina was one of the last. I fought to raise the wage, successfully did that to $15 an hour for many of our state employees. I fought to end discrimination. I took on cash bill and its disenfranchisement on black and brown people. When my experience took me from going up on a farm in Northampton County, picking cucumbers from can't see in the morning to can't see at night, does anybody know what that feels like? Understanding how God's people deserve to be served in an excellent way, I had the fortunate opportunity to go to North Carolina a and State University where I majored in mechanical engineering. And after growing up on that family farm, I um, had a desire to be a pilot, and so God did not bless me with the vision that I needed. And so at the time, I said, if I can't fly the plane, I will design the plane. But Eastern North Carolina, Northampton County specifically, this has been my home for the last 30 years of my adult life, outside of the 15 years that I spent in Seattle, Washington. When I lost my dad, and I had moved back home from, from Northern Virginia, my dad had early onset of dementia, and he served his country well. Being one of the youngest girls, I knew that it was my responsibility to come back. And when I moved back, this community was there for me. As I watched my parents and my grandparents hold on to the family farm that they gained through sharecropping, same land that their ancestors, our ancestors were slaved on, this community was there for me as they fought to hold on to the family farm. 
When I lost my five-year-old son, those were some of the worst days of my life and navigating a broken healthcare system. This was a community that was there for me. And so when Congressman G.K. Butterfield, with his amazing service to Eastern North Carolina, announced that he was stepping down, I knew someone needed to step up. And that couldn't be just anyone. That needed to be someone with a demonstrated successful record of fighting for God's people. I have served in the spirit of Deborah who had a relationship over God's people before God put her in a political relationship over his people. And it is in that I am fighting to represent communities, not corporations, in Washington, D.C. My platform is a bold platform that takes on racism and injustice. I will continue to fight for historic appropriations for our HBCUs, just as I did as a state senator. I will continue my fight for minority businesses, just as I did in the General Assembly, I will do when I get to Washington, D.C. If you pray for me, if you support me, and if you vote for me, we will build an Eastern North Carolina that works for all of us, not just the wealthy, not just the well-connected. I am running on a rural New Deal that understands the importance of investing in Main Street. I am pro-business. I am pro-justice. I am pro-investing in a beautiful part of the state so that our children who grew up in this beautiful place that we call home don't have to choose or decide whether or not they can come back and to raise their families just as they were raised. I am fighting for that North Carolina where we have job growth, where we have infrastructure investments, where we have universal broadband, where we have universal health care. Our rural hospitals are under attack. And so because my community was there for me, I want to be there for my community. Last but not least, I leave you with a few questions. Do you want an America that pays its workers what they're worth and pays teachers their value? Do you want an America that ends racism and builds systems of equity instead? Do you want an America where everybody is guaranteed broadband, a good paying job, health care, clean air, clean water? Do you want an America that feeds its families from family farms and not corporate farms? Do you want an America where your zip code is not your destiny and your block doesn't determine your blessings? Well, if that's the America that you want, you can't even spell that America without Erica. I am Erica for us, one of us for all of us, one of us who will fight for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Erica. Senator Kahn, will you take your time? Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Daniel, to the Eastern Alliance. Uh, it's truly a pleasure to be with you tonight. Let me first start by giving a huge, a huge Eastern North Carolina shout out to my friend, our friend, the Honorable G. K. Bonneville, for being in the trenches and fighting for us, fighting for our families, and he's done it so well for over 18 years. Oh, we can do better than that, G.K. <laughs> now, let me tell you, Congressman has fought so hard for us. And he announced his retirement. And when he announced his retirement, he went on to say, and I don't believe it's time to pass on the torch. Well, I'm so glad to share with you that I am running to be our next congressman for the 1st Congressional District. And I want to share with you why. This is time now, more than ever, that we must empower the next generation of leaders and entrepreneurs in order to rebuild and grow Eastern North Carolina. And I want to be clear here. North Carolina will not be the state that it can and should be by leaving Eastern North Carolina behind. And I'm running because I want to make sure that we get our fair share in Washington, D.C. I grew up 
My grandmother made a deal with my mom. She said, hey, my mom was still in high school at the time I was born. She said, I'm going to take care of you, this child, but you have to go to school. My grandmother had not stepped foot into college. My mom went on to Bennett College, and she graduated with a math degree. And she came back to the East, and she finally landed her dream job at IBM in the research final, and eventually along to Raleigh, Durham, to Texas. And I graduated from the Air Force Academy in 1994. But let me share with you about Grandma. There were three things important that were really important in our household. She taught me early in life, number one, that faith can move mountains. It can, y'all. It can, and you know it. She taught me, too, that once you put something in here, it's hard to take it out and get rid of it. And she was talking about the value of education. And Grandma made it out of high school, hadn't gone to college. My, my grandfather dropped out of high school to work on the farm. That was just the way it was. Then the third thing she taught us was hard work can pay off. And it's these values that I've held on to, no matter where I've been, no matter if it was serving our country in the United States Air Force, and I served eight years after duty, even as a mortuary officer, putting the last uniform on, going out there and picking up half of a boot with a foot in it, trying to get it back to the family. I went on to hold on to these values, no matter if it was over 20 years I've served in education, in higher education, teaching at the community college and at East Carolina University. I held on to those values as a mayor with the executive experience serving a community over seven years in Snow Hill. I held on to grandma's values, yes, even in the state senate. And let me be clear, I've been serving in the state senate now for nearly 12 years. And over those 12 years, it was grandma's values that were instilled in me, that I held on to. Because I want to be clear what I do believe this election is about. It's about having someone with a track record and the background and experience of getting the job done. And while serving in the state senate, I've actually authored and been a primary sponsor of over nearly 90 pieces of legislation. So when we talk about raising the age, I want to be clear. I was the primary sponsor of the bill to raise the age in North Carolina. We must stop treating our kids like adults. And let them be kids and learn from tough mistakes and tough times. When we talk about not just raising the age, but raising wages, you're looking at one of the conferees. And when we sat down, I want to be clear what I told the Republicans. I said you will not have a budget in this state when we're leaving our hardest workers behind, our school bus drivers. <laughs> our school bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, some of the hardest workers, but we knew the, um, the most underpaid. And guess what I'm so proud of, y'all? Because of that work this July, every single state employee will reach that $15 an hour. Amen. So we've been working hard. We kept Elizabeth City State University, those doors open. We kept the doors open for the Eastern um, High Pregnancy Risk Center. Here's what I want to share. I still believe. I believe in the power of prayer. And I know there are a lot of prayers that's going up for me. I believe in the power of us when we come together and what we can do. I believe in us. I believe in Eastern North Carolina. Let's get this done and we can do it together because while some want us to stay home and not vote, it's important now more than ever that we get out the vote. Thank you so much, Bishop. One of the areas we've been working real hard to get um, a 
associated and working hard with the Alliance is our Wilson area. And I thank uh, my brothers and his sisters that are here tonight from the Wilson area uh, that are here to share. And so we're going to hear from uh, the representatives from your area. We'll begin with you, uh, Senator Fitch. We'll begin with you. Thank you very much, Bishop. To all the ministers and others who are present, it's good to be here with you. I am Milton F. Toby Fitch. I am one of five children of Milton and Cora Fitch. Parents who are very loving and who believe in public education. All of us, all five of us, have gone on to college and received terminal degrees. I practice law in the several courts of the state of North Carolina. I practice, practice law in the several courts of North Carolina for over 40 years. I first served this state as a state representative representing Wilson, Nash, and Edgecombe counties. I then left the state house and went to the bench as a Superior Court judge where I served for 18 years. And upon retiring, uh, I went to the State Senate. I've been to the State Senate ever since 2018. I'm glad to have in this forum, but I will say to you that the thing that is happening in Eastern North Carolina is a common thread. Regardless of what myself or other candidates who are present here, our platforms are not that much different. Our approaches are not that much different. You hold the balance of power of how it works because if you do not go out and vote, then we can't win and we can't articulate the things that are important to our area. What is my platform? It is getting rid of some of these tier one counties that are in eastern North Carolina, which means creating jobs, making sure that our children are able to learn and can produce broadband and the same things that you hear over and over and over again. The same things that Republicans and others do not want to go for are the things that we should be going for because they are the things that control how we live, work, and play. Uh, those of you who are from Wilson County, if there's any here from Wayne County or Greene County, ask for your support. Uh, I will not run. Uh, my, my, my opponent is, is my friend. So I'm not going to run a, a dirty campaign and I don't believe that he will either. We'll speak to the issues. We probably have slightly different ideas about how you get to that mountaintop, but we do know, both of us, that there is a mountaintop and we do know that one day and soon and very soon, we ought to get to the top of that mountain. And I thank you for your prayers, and I solicit your vote. Representative Raymond Smith will call you next. You will set you the opponent. I, well, first of all, I want to uh, dispel that, as uh, Senator Fitch did, he is not my opponent. He's so that is not what this is about. Uh, what this is about more than anything else is how do we have, what, what gives us the best chance going forward of keeping this seat in the General Assembly? And that's what this is really about. Um, again, I want to introduce myself to some and um, present myself to others. I am Representative Raymond Smith. I hail from Goldsboro, North Carolina, born and raised. Uh, I'm a proud Aggie. North Carolina a and State University. Uh, all right. I also got I got my master's degree from North Carolina Central for any Eagles that's in the house. And I have my doctorate in education leadership from Fayetteville State for any Broncos in the house. Did you notice the thing? I'm an HBCU guy all day, every day. And um, one of the things that I have fought for since I have been in the General Assembly since 2018 was equitable funding for our HBCUs. We fought tooth and nail with the Senate and uh, the House working together. We fought tooth and nail for equitable funding. 
We have two land grant colleges here in the state of North Carolina. One is NC State and the other is North Carolina A&T State University. But if you look at the funding for these two schools, it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The disparity in funding between the two schools who have the exact same mission, okay? They have the same agricultural mission for the state of North Carolina, but the funding is, is, is just disparately uh, atrocious. It's something that no one can sit, sit, sit stand by and see and not have something to say about it. That being said, I am the only child of Raymond Sr. and Delma Smith, now both deceased. My father was a United States Marine, and after he left the Marine Corps after three years, he went to work for the federal government at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in Goldsboro. He worked there for 35 years until his retirement. My mother, Thelma Smith, also an Aggie, um, is a proud member of AKA, sorry Erica. Um, and she um, was a lifelong educator. My mother was an educator for 38 years in Wayne County Public School System. And after she retired from education, she went and won her first seat for the Board of Education. And she served as a school board member for 18 years until her passing. So public service is in my blood. Uh, it's something that I just don't know any better. And I don't want to know any better. It's just who I am. Um, so back to my story. Uh, of course, when I went to a and I went to play football. And uh, for those of you who are football fans and fanatics like myself, that was really what my focus was. I actually forgot that I was supposed to go to class. <laughs> no, I didn't forget, I just didn't go. Um, and because of that, um, A&T said, well, Mr. Smith, thank you for playing football, but it's time for you to go home because you forgot what you were here for. So um, one of the greatest blessings in my life was getting sent home from college on academic probation. Because what it did, it sent me to the United States Army. And I'm so proud of my service to this country. I am uh, a decorated combat veteran from Operation Desert Storm. Um, I, I, I stand firmly and proudly uh, before you as uh, having made the ultimate uh, decision to sacrifice for this country. And I will continue to sacrifice for this district if you give me your vote. But it's what I've done in the General Assembly since I've been there that I'm really proud of. Before going to the General Assembly, I was the first African American ever elected in the history of Wayne County for the at-large seat on the Board of Education. And if you know Wayne County, Wayne County is not a Democratic county by any stretch of the imagination. So to have won that seat countywide in and of itself tells you who I am to my community. And Wayne County will probably, it, it probably makes up approximately 60% of this new district. So again, this, these are just things that we need to keep in mind as we go forward. But while in the General Assembly, in this most recent budget, I'm proud to say that I sponsored a bill called House Bill 921. Um, my seatmate, uh, Reverend Daly, was a co-sponsor with me on that bill. And one of the things that I'm so proud of is that the bill was for Tier 1 communities. Now, the bill did not pass as a standalone bill, but I spoke with the speaker, I had his uh, support, and the bill was incorporated in the budget in the form of grants. Those grants can be now found through the Golden Leaf Foundation. For those of you who have nonprofits and are part of governmental entities, those grants are now available. They are grants and loans that are for tier one communities, for workforce preparedness, for job creation, in our rural communities, and that is so critical and so important, and I'm very proud of that effort. And lastly, um, I also was a sponsor of House Bill 946, the primary sponsor. That is a sound basic education for every child. And of course, education being part of my background, you know, it is incumbent upon anyone who, who is here to understand that if we are going to do something about the economy, in Eastern North Carolina, it starts with a sound basic education system. Our basic edu our education system is in need of respiration. They need help. And one of the things that I commit to is to making sure that we have a good solid educational foundation 
for our region so that our economics will not be a problem in the future. Thank you so much, and I'm Raymond E. Smith, Jr., and I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. A lot of this, one of the things we've been fighting hard for is policing, um, making sure that our kids get the best shot when they get to the court systems. And so I thought it not robbery to have our district attorney, who has been our district attorney, but running again this, this season, to come and talk to us. He doesn't have a primary, but talk to us about, about his platform and why it's important for us to get out and vote for him. So, Ms. Davis. Thank you, Bishop, and uh, good evening to everyone, and thank the Alliance for the invitation. I very much appreciate the opportunity uh, to come out and speak uh, and answer questions about what we do in the court system. So, uh, why am I here? Uh, why am I coming back and asking you to support me and vote for me um, again? It is rooted in the reason that I came back here as a young lawyer 45 years ago. After talking to uh, Julius Chambers, who was teaching at my law school, I had a job offer, and I also had some conversations with Judge Sumner, who was then practicing with uh, G.K. and Toby, about whether or not to come back uh, home to Rocky Mount, to Nash County, uh, and provide uh, the educational services and expertise I had to better my community. Um, and the late, great Julius Chambers convinced me that it was time for those of us who had been benefited by the hard work of our parents, our grandparents, our community leaders, it was time for us to come back home and get back. And so 45 years ago, in August of 1977, uh, that's what I did, and I'm continuing to try to do that uh, tonight by asking you to keep me in office. <laughs> so what's my platform? Uh, I'm a pretty direct and simple person, and my platform is simple. I practiced law for 22 years as a private lawyer. I represented uh, people in the criminal and civil courts of this state. Um, my colleagues, Toby and GK and all of us, uh, would gather sometimes on Friday, even though we were in different cities, to talk about some of our issues and problems and share, because we didn't have mentors. We had to count on each other. I did that for 22 years. Uh, and in 1999, I had, I had the opportunity to be appointed to the district court by the then governor, uh, Jim Hunt. He asked me a question that evening. Uh, he interviewed us, and he asked me, he said, if I appoint you to this job, what kind of judge are you gonna be? And my answer was this. Thousands of people come through our court system every year. They come through for various reasons. Most of them don't come through because they are the worst of the worst. They just had a little bump in the road. And what I said to Governor Hunt was, those people, Governor, when they come in to my courtroom as a judge, I don't want them to have to get up feeling sick in the morning about coming in their courtroom. I want them to come in understanding that whatever they have done, with some help and some guidance, and maybe some discipline, we can help them get back to where they need to get to. But if you, can't, if you come in court, Governor, and you hurt somebody, you don't want to see me. And that has been the basis of my platform. We handle thousands of cases a year you don't care about. And we're not out to bury people who have issues under the jail. We're out to try to help them, even though we have to administer justice. But we're also serious about the people who are committing violent acts and destroying fat families and destroying our communities. And that's what our focus will remain if I'm reelected. But that's not all we do. Uh, as I said to Governor Hunt, as I've said through the years, there are many people who have issues that bring into the courtroom that need our help and need our assistance. And we have been about that in the DA's office. Uh, we recently uh, at Word Tabernacle in conjunction with um, Reverend Gallup and some of his people conducted a driver's license restoration program. Um, one of the first of its kind you know, in the state of North Carolina. We had students from Cameron University. We had several of our ADAs there. And we actually sat down with people who had driver's license issues and tried to help them 
restore their licenses so they could become productive citizens. You know, we still live in an area where if you don't have a driver's license, you got a problem. You can't uh, probably get a job. Uh, you can't get around. And so there are many people who are operating on the edges uh, and the extremes of not being able to do the little things they need to do to get back uh, into um, our uh, society. I am told that um, that license restoration program was very successful. I know we had about 60 people there. It was all three counties, by the way. It wasn't just Rocky Mountains. Nash Shakes from the Wilson County. Uh, and that we had, we were able to help at least 60% of the people who came to that program about uh, a month ago get their licenses uh, restored. And that is a boom to those of you who are in business. You know that we need reliable workers. Uh, and that, in my judgment, uh, as I've discussed many times, is an economic development issue. So the point I'm making is we're not just about putting people away. Uh, we're about producing um, efforts to help those who need a little bit of a boost. We've done a great deal, uh, for example, before we got raised to age. Um, I made sure that all my prosecutors knew that when our children came into court and they were eligible for a diversion, that they got a diversion. And so we were um, about doing that well in advance of raised to age, which we fully support. And so my, my platform is to continue to do the work of the community, uh, to be accessible, uh, to be open to ideas, uh, and to be open uh, to making sure that uh, as a community we are safe, we are productive, uh, and we are taken care of. Uh, I appreciate your vote with all. Let me just say this real quick. In November, here's what you will not hear. You will not hear anything about who's the most qualified, because I will be. <laughs> okay. And you won't hear anything about the competence of my office, because that will not be an issue. So I'll leave it up to you to know what the issue will be. Thank you very much. Since this is Candy Smith, how about you address us next District 5, correct? I'm running for our North State Senate, and so we'll hear from you next. Thank you so much, Bishop Daniels, and to um, Eastern North Carolina Alliance of Ministers, uh, guests, friends who are here. Um, I want to start by saying I did not choose politics. Politics chose me. Uh, when I first moved to Greenville, North Carolina, I worked and fought for the people. And um, I pledged Dr. to Sinathea, the only sorority. And um, just want to make sure, I, 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 yeah, I got a bit clear about that. But, but one of the things that I learned um, was you got to be involved. Because I often say that if you're not at the table, many times you're on the menu. And so I saw a lot of issues happening within my community. And I used to hear at some of our conferences, I don't care if you run up a dog catcher, you need to run up a something. Because it is about representing the people. And so from there, I said, let me think about running. Because someone approached me and said, you should run. I said, let me see. Because I was you know, new to the area, trying to learn what it entails. Well, from there, I uh, registered because they said, you said you was going to run. Well, I got kind of stuck. And so I went down the last day, 10 minutes left of filing, and I filed. And um, I ran for the seat, and the incumbent was there for 22 years. Um, I said, one or two things are going to happen. If I'm going to win, I know I'm going to fight for the community. But if I don't win, I know that the incumbent must fight for the community, because you see there's someone else serious about doing the work. Well, it was in God's plan. I won by 12 votes. And ever since then, I have been serving. So that's why I say I didn't choose politics, it chose me. I served on Greenville City Council for nine years. I served as the first African-American female mayor for the city of Greenville as well. Now, in my term as mayor, I was there for five months. The, the current mayor, or the mayor who was in position when I was there, um, got appointed by the governor to another position. And so then I was um, elected by my peers to serve as mayor. Um, during that time, I saved the city $9.2 million in a green grant 
to take care of our infrastructure because we have a lot of flooding in Greenville. I had to work closely with the state, had to fight for my community. And um, I was told that there's been no seated mayor, even who served consecutive terms, to save the city that much money. I am a fighter. I decided not to stay on the city council board um, 10 years because other people have visions. And so you have to make sure you allow new blood to come in and see how things can be done. So from there, I decided to run for the house. And I am serving my second term in the house. Um, I can say when I was serving my first term, they probably labeled me as a troublemaker. Don't look at me, Raymond James. Um, the reason why they probably called me the troublemaker is because I believe in fighting for the people. I believe in putting people first. And so I did approach a peer and I said, how come you're not saying anything? And he said, you know, it's kind of hard when you're not in the majority. They kind of say what they want and do what they want. It's just hard. And I said, the only thing we have to make sure we understand, even if we don't have a vote, we always have a voice. And so my job is to make sure that you, the people, have a voice. And so I fought in my first term, and I was very surprised to hear that as a freshman legislator, I was able to pass more bills than any other Democrat in the House, which shocked me. But that's what fighting is about. Um, I also am just one of those individuals. I try to be as accessible as possible. I try to be as transparent with my work, but I try to make sure I give the people a voice. So I don't have many people to say, I try to reach you and I can never talk to you. Because if I can't answer immediately, I do my best to make sure that I call back. I looked at um, some of the challenges going forward, and I knew that Eastern North Carolina needed a strong fighter to, to serve in the Senate since the seat was being vacated by Senator Davis. And so I knew I needed to step up to the plate with my years of experience and my fight. And I said, you know what? What better person than me? He prepared me for such a time as this. And so I'm now running to support and encourage the people of Edgecombe and Pitt County to fight for those things that are important for them. My platform issues are affordable housing, economic development, education, criminal justice reform, and healthcare. And so we know that we have issues that we must fight for because equity is something that we've not seen much, but we won't see it if we stop fighting. So if I'm anything, I am a fighter. And so I encourage you to make sure that you are paying attention to the issues, making sure that you know those people who are accessible and ready and willing to serve and fight for you. My name is Candy Smith. I believe in putting people over politics. So let's make sure we put people first. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be here with you today. God bless you. Representative Linda Cooper South's District 24 re-election to the House. That's correct, Mr. James, and thank you so much for allowing me to be here this evening. Now, I need to find out in Sharpsburg, because that's my new district. I'm part of Nash County now. I served on the redistricting committee, which was truly a learning experience. But one of the things that was transparent, that, kept, that we kept saying over and over again, was that transparency. We wanted our legislative people to elect our legislators instead of our legislators electing, be, be, electing choosing the people. So we, so we worked hard, and, and whenever we came out of, whenever the maps went to, to, with the lawsuits, we knew that was going to take place. So is there anyone in the house in Sharpsburg this evening? If not, I'm, I look forward to representing that part of Nash County, and I am truly excited to do that. Let me tell you a little about me. I am Linda Cooper Suggs. I grew up in a farming community in Sampson County. So I've lived in Eastern North Carolina all of my life, and I understand, and I have seen the disparities that people have had here in Eastern North Carolina, whether it's with jobs, whether it's with health care, and those are the things that I fight for. 
I grew up in a family of nine, my mom, my dad, and my six brothers. And yes, I was probably spoiled somewhat, but my mama made sure that everything was taken care of. She was a short person like me, but she could handle all of us with my dad, with my dad being there. I went off to North Carolina a and State University, but one thing I want to share with you about going up to East North Carolina. I can't remember waking up at one o'clock in the morning taking out points of divine. Some of you can relate to that. I can remember us making money going to those blueberry fields and strawberry fields and working in that tobacco and all of that, picking cucumbers and stuff, so that we could help my mom and dad to purchase our school clothes. I can't remember in elementary school when the teachers told us that we had new books, and when we looked at the inside front cover, all the names had been filled in with these unfamiliar names. We had received the hand me downs But I had teachers and I had my parents who continued to tell us, you know, work hard in spite of all those disadvantages. Those persons continued to push us, push us forward. And yes, I am Aggie, Aggie Pride. And I'm one of those pinky green ladies too. So therefore, <laughs> the first thing to find is that therefore that's who I am as well. And it's about service to all mankind. And not part of, not, not just part of sect of this society. But when I work, I work for everyone. I serve as chair of the um, Democratic Party of Wilson County. I served as campaign manager. I'm the head deacon in my church, Jackson Chapel First Missionary Baptist Church, which is basically real dominated, but we know that God sees through. And with wonderful pastors and working with people, and therefore we know what we have to do with prayer and supplication. We get there. Now, what am I about? I, I did not plan this journey. I retired, I'm a retired educator. I taught for about 33 years in the educational system. And so therefore, when I retired, my plan was to work for two or three days, maybe work four to six weeks sometimes, and then to enjoy life a little. I have two adult children, a son and a daughter. My son lives in Nebraska, my daughter lives in Mali. And I have two grandbabies and one grandbaby on the way. And I am a single mom. So I understand the plight of women, of single women, taking care of their children, uh, living, making very little, but having to make everything, make it in, make, have everything strict so that you'll have a little money by the end of the quarter month end. So I understand all of that. So then I bring that to the table. When I walk into the room as a freshman in the North Carolina House of Representatives, I carry with me who I am. A country girl, a hard worker, one who believes in strong religious, religious values because that's what my parents taught us. So what do I stand for? I stand for education because whenever we voted on a budget that only gave 5% to teachers, 2 and one half percent this year, 2 and one half percent next year, and then also with the bonuses, I thought that was too a slap in the face of the educational system. When we're not paying our teachers, for a master's pay, this is an educational system. I mean, what are we thinking about? And the money is there. We know that. But when I look at our school systems in Eastern North Carolina, when I look at Leandro, full funding of Leandro, would bring to Wilson County just this year in 2022 almost $720,000. And in 2028, we get almost $28 million. I see what's happening to our elementary schools. They are 50, 75 years old, and even if you go in and fix them, whether it's Wilson County, Nash County, Edgecombe County, or whatever, we must fund those schools. Every child has a right to a, not only a sound-based education, but they have a right to be to a state-of-the-art education. Well, whenever they walk up on that ground, that school doesn't look like it did whenever it was 50 years ago. So therefore, that's what I fight for. I fight, yes, for our support staff. Okay, one minute. Yeah. <laughs> I fight the staff. I fight for affordable housing because we realize that there are too many people living on the street, and now, because of where we're situated, Rob is there, we are here, people are living in our communities, going back and forth to Rob and to work, which is wonderful. But the cost of living is increasing here, the rents are increasing, the cost of the houses are increasing, and our people really can't afford it. And yes, my father and my brothers, five of my, five of my brothers were veterans. So therefore, I stand with our veterans. I stand for Medicaid expansion because I'm tired of seeing people die. 
who should have health care in Eastern North Carolina and it's not working for them. And those persons who can't afford it because they're part of that gap system. You make too little or you don't make enough, you're not on a $17,000 point. Thank you so much, Bishop. And thank you, Nash County. Thank you so much, So as we um, are coming close to the end, and uh, we're going to say, we're going to save uh, Mr. Shelley for last. We're going to move to District 25, Pastor Garriott, and we'll, we'll let the, the boss of all close us out, Mr. Shelley. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for being thank you for your leadership, Bishop, and uh, Pastor Worthy for hosting. Yo, I feel like the seventh preacher on Good Friday. <laughs> so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be quick here. Um, share a quick story with you. We had a controversial education issue hit our community. And I decided as a pastor that I would talk to my representative. And so I went to Rodney to meet my representative to talk about this important education issue. And they pushed me off from time to time to time. I waited, waited, waited. Had to come back the second day. Had to come back the third day. Finally, I get to my representative on that third day. And uh, I'm about to sit down in his office. And he looks at me and says, don't sit down. Nothing you're going to say matters. And I remember that feeling. I remember being dismissed. What all I was really trying to do was represent some people that had an issue. And so I came back and decided to figure out a way to run. And then, First time around, I lost. And the second time, 2018, 2020, all y'all were wonderful enough to send me to the State House to represent you. At the end of the day, this is no diss on being a politician. I'm a pastor. And I know when folk get out of the baptism pool, they gotta walk into sometimes some unsafe streets. And sometimes those schools are not the best. At the end of the day, you want what's best for people. And so that's why I ran. That's why I continue to run. Because the reality of it is, I can say this to a room full of church folk and pastors, I've never preached a sermon good enough to give people health care access. Never preached a sermon good enough to make insulin costs cheaper. I've never preached a sermon that good. So public policy sometimes works against the work of our churches. We need people that are helping craft those policies that can really accompany and complement the work of nonprofits, for profits in our community. And so, in the back row, I have some constituent service guides. The reason I brought them is because I went to Raleigh saying I would do three things. First, I said I would go to Raleigh and I would author, I call it the ABCs. I would author legislation that made sense. You go to jamesgillian.com, you look up, introduce bills, and you can see every bill I've introduced in this last session. And you can see they're about education, they're about health care, they're about environmental issues, they're about safer streets, they're about uh, creating a, a racial equity and criminal justice. So I offer those kinds of bills to help all of us. Secondly, I build relationships. I build relationships because we serve in the minority. And I don't mean that as people of color. I mean the General Assembly is controlled right now by Republicans. And so sometimes your best legislation gets thrown in the trash, literally. And so the way you can help people, though, is through relationships. And so I spent a third of my time building relationships with the State Department, building relationships with Congress, building relationships with the Department of Public Instruction so that we can help people even though we can't always push through our legislation. And then the last thing is constituent services. So when people actually call the office, we can actually get something done for them. This is what I'll say, and I'm asking you to vote again. I'm asking you to send me back. And this is what I'm going to ask you. I don't have a primary election, a primary race, but I do have a general election race. Whoever my opponent is, I have no idea who it will be. I've never once publicly spoken the name of any of my opponents, and I never will. This is whoever it is. 
This is what you're going to say about them. Who are they? You're not going to know them, whoever it is. For the years I've served, served, this is what you can say about James Gale here. Number one, I'm strong. I take some hard votes. But sometimes I had to take it on the chin, but I'm not up there. I sleep with my conscience, and I'm going to take strong votes. You can say I'm steady. I've been serving this community for 17 years. I'm going to keep serving this community. And you can say I'm seen. Like me or not, you know me. And I'm seen. And so I'm asking you to send me back so I can keep providing strong, steady, and seen leadership in the State House. This is what I say in closing, Bishop, because if I would say I'm almost closing and don't do it, I'm not a preacher, right? So, the last election in Nash County, 14,900 registered voters did not vote. 14,900 just in Nash County. Don't forget, Sherry Beasy, who's hopefully will be our next U.S. Senator, lost her election by 401 votes. South Rocky Mount Precinct alone could have carried her. Edwards alone could have carried her. Sharpsburg alone could have. And without beg of us as pastors and everybody in the room, we have to work hard to turn out the vote. We have to work for people to understand the value of this, and we can't leave a single vote on the table. Thank you for being here. Well, Mr. Shelley, it's on you. Oh, this is good. One good thing about being the last person, uh, you know, a lot of stuff has already been said. So I'm going to say, you know, to everything that's been said, uh, all the bills that have been passed and sponsored, I was proud of that. I have a connection with everyone up here, some kind of way. We talked about the, this past budget and who was at the table. Well, there was two people here that was at the table among the Democrats and the seven of us and the rest were Republicans. And we are the ones who made sure that those things stayed in the budget and those things that were put in the budget. And let me say this, all the Aggies, I'm a Viking. This is the city. That's Viking pride. Now, Elizabeth said at this time received more money than all the other colleges. All the other colleges. Okay, now I'm not saying that because I was up there, but I like to think I had a little bit to do with it. Okay, make sure it stayed in there because it was put in there. The other thing, too, is that uh, representation. One thing that was said about representing people flying up there. Well, well let me go back. Uh, unlike some people who might have been thrown into politics or politics picked them. I picked politics. Well, I picked to serve. Not necessarily politics, but I picked to serve. I knew what I was going to do when I was 12th grade, where I was going to be. Okay, so I'm doing what I love to do. And I like to think of myself as a statesman rather than a politician. What does that mean? That means I can negotiate. Uh, I have relationships with both sides, and I think I'm respected, and, and I think I have some influence because of some of the committees I serve on, which are some of the major committees. And so that's a reason to have somebody there. When you talk about uh, serving people with constituents, I think that's one of the things that I enjoy the most, and that is when somebody calls my office. There is something that I can do. I can put you in contact with somebody. You might have been calling an office for three or four times or ten times and you haven't got anybody. I can guarantee you that when you call my office after we get off the phone, somebody's going to be calling you with an hour from that office, whatever that department is. One thing about whether you're in the minority or not, but as a legislator, departments, they do respond to us. And they have people sign just for us that when we call, they get us answers. So, so that's there. Now, this election, 
And I'll just jump forward. This election, we always say that this election is the most important election that we've had. This is. If we start with the General Assembly, if we allow the Republicans to get a super majority, all that stuff I was saying about being at the table and all, that goes out the door. Because first thing they tell us that we don't need you, and they come in and they pass whatever they want to. Now what has happened in the last few years, we've been, we've been in the minority as far as members, but we have stopped a lot of bad legislation. You just don't know. It's a lot of bad legislation that's been proposed, but we were able to stop it. How? We have a government, we have a government, we have a government, he vetoed it, and we sustained his veto. He is not law. Uh, it's no veto that he's done has been overwritten. So you see why it's important that you send us back. Those of us that are there, seniority needs something. Uh, the only thing somebody asked me one time, so why don't you, don't you want to run for the Senate? When this thing comes to no. Why would I want to go? No reflection. Why would I want to go to the Senate and be a freshman? Because when you go over as a freshman, you start over. That's it. But I'm not a freshman in the house. I mean, I have seniority. So I enjoy that. So I'm going to ask you to go out and support me again, as you have done. And let me also say this. You know, uh, I'm a determined kind of guy. I don't talk a lot, uh, most of the time. But I say something if I got something to say. And I will speak up. I'm not afraid. If I'm not afraid of being the only one to go away if I think the other side is not right. Uh, one thing I will not do, and that will, I will not give up my integrity. And my whole thing, my whole bottom of my campaign, everything I've done, and everything I propose to do, is that I, what I want to do for my district and my people is to raise the level of expectation. Because one of the things that I discovered when I first got out running, you know, everybody said, well, it's not going to do anything. I don't know why, you know, you just going to do anything. So one of the things I decided, what I want to do is raise the level of expectation. So you send us up there, you expect something from us. And you demand something from us. And we need to give you something. And let me close by saying this. My thought is that politicians are not uh, employers. They're employees. And we need to treat them that way. And so you need, you're our boss, and you need to make sure that you give us the kind of instruction we need to make sure that we bring back what you asked them for. Thank you. So Alliance and friends, we've heard from all of the constituents here, and so we're going to take the next few minutes to ask any questions that might come from the body. Remember, you ask a question and let somebody answer. Now, if you want to give your spiel on something, pull them to the side after we finish here. And give you a spiel. If you have a question, come on and ask the question. Anybody have a question for anyone on the panel at this time? Reverend Gray. My question is to the people that's running for the House and the Senate here in North Carolina. Why do we have? Why do we do not have? a board that is governing the broadband system. Who wants to answer that? Look, could I, uh, I, mean, I don't know if this will answer your question, but I can tell you that uh, when you say a board that's governing broadband, what we do have uh, our um, what is it called? Um, utilities Commission. Pardon me? Utilities Commission. Yeah. The, the, the Utilities Commission uh, overall, but, but I think what I'm trying to get at that, not only do we have that, but uh, the legislature really. I mean, when we make laws or make regulations, you know, we set the stage. Now, the, uh, the, the tech people in our, for the legislature, is one who are uh, really setting the rules because they're the one that's, that's deciding it. That.
But as far as broadband is concerned, everybody is concerned about it. And everybody has a say so about it. Uh, and and it's, there will be some other stuff coming out that will address that directly. And I, and I will add to that. One of the reasons you don't have that commission that uh, you're speaking of is because broadband, although it's one of the most nonpartisan issues that we have in the General Assembly, is still a political issue. And what makes it so political is that we have uh, laws on the books right now that prohibit municipalities from being competitive in the broadband industry. And I have been approached by some of these municipalities, and they were they are, they are asking, well, you know, why can't we get in the broadband business? Well, there's the politics behind that are that these these small companies, these private companies, are lobbying the Republican Party to make sure that they don't get any competition. So that's the politics that's inside this whole issue. So you know, you know that commission that you speak of, uh, and I think uh, uh, Senator Fitch is right. We do have the utilities commission to regulate it, but to make sure that we have. A, a broadband commission itself is still tied up in the politics of uh, the governmental entities versus the private who's going to provide the service. I want to call everybody's attention to communities like Wilson, communities like Rocky Mountain. Uh, the same thing that we're talking about, Reverend Gray. Uh, no control was at the state level, the local level. Ended up buying a pig and a coat, came to let the cities, you got the highest utilities around. Broadband is somewhat local because of all the problems that exist on the locale as to how you get it. The lines, for the most part, in order to hold the cost down, run with the companies that own the utility coast. Years ago, when we started repairing highways and building, we did not do the right thing at that time for the state level, because every time you dug a hole, you should have done what? Put a coax in there that would have taken the band. Now what's happening in places like Tarboro, Pitt County, that have electric co-ops are now being asked <coughs> to totally fund where the for-profit people are because they just passed a law that uh, we're going to charge these folks in co-ops extra money if they did not replace poles within a certain period of time. And these companies never put any money into it, and the hard-earned money that you paid in your co-ops, they are asking to let that be underwritten by them. So it is still a, a, an issue in motion based off of the IT people that work for the General Assembly. Might I ask my question? Okay. Broadband allowed my children, my grandchildren, to watch the TV, but it will not run their laptop. There's not enough speed. That's what I'm asking. Well, if I may. That technological issue is out here now as to what's going to happen to 3G, 4G, and now 5G. So everybody is retooling for that because your 4G basically now is obsolete anyway because you stepped up. And those things, and that is a moving target that is political, while the issue itself may not be the implementation of it. Anybody else? Another question? Um, we'll, we'll go here, then we'll come to you, uh, Mercy. Yes, yes, ma'am.
Can we restate our question? Sure, the question has to do with, and I hope I'm stating it correctly, how do we reinvest or invest in our own communities as opposed to using big corporations? How do we create those jobs, create those economic engine? So, I'm sorry, and build the skills. And so, it's touching on two things. One is just around workforce itself. It's probably the issue I'm most passionate about. Um, and so we do have to build the workforce within rural communities. I actually have a meeting coming up next week with Old and Lee over this very issue. And it's an issue that we fight with the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus we're fighting for in terms of how we make sure our historically underutilized businesses and some of our rural communities are really benefited from this a massive amount of federal dollars and state dollars that are coming down. We do have what's called the GREAT program, Growing Rural Economies um, by Accessing Technology, and more and more money is being put into that program, and there is a real effort of making sure that within our own communities we're building those workforces. And I would encourage um, area nonprofits, uh, churches, um, to really prepare themselves to be recipients of that. That means having audited financials. That means having clear board records. It means really being in a position. Because one of the things you know, as it relates to our communities, our rural communities, is that we lack the capacity. So they wind up using an intermediary agency that quote unquote has the capacity. And I think what we need to be working hard to do is making sure that we build that capacity so we can do exactly what you're talking about. Thank you. 
Yes, I don't want to be political about it, but I don't believe uh, that federal state is the only. In the midnight hour of the budget, uh, not this year, but uh, in the last year, they put monies in, meaning the ruling party, put monies in that gave a large sum of money to Wingate College. <laughs> I say that to say that there are enough folks in eastern North Carolina to change the complexity of what that house on West Jones looks like. They are elected by folks who go along with what they want, care how much we vote against them. When you can see the millions of dollars that went to a private didn't even have a program. They put the money there for them to build a program around the money that they do. So if nothing else, that should be enough encouragement to all of us to talk to all of our friends and tell them, let's register and let's vote because the future of tomorrow depends on what we do today.
Well, I asked and tried to um, have an amendment to make sure we included um, it, uh, teaching about African American history and Native American history. So I did have HB 711 that I introduced as a bill, and they said, let us think about it. So if you guys don't know, not only are they trying to change history, they're trying to erase your history. It's okay to be able to talk about um, you know, how we're moving forward, but it's not okay to tell the whole truth because you were yelling and screaming at Ruby D. Bridges who were trying to go to school to, to um, integrate the schools. It's not okay to talk about racism when we felt bad, but if you make them feel bad because their parents were slave owners, that's a problem. So we need to understand you're going to either go back to what we talked about earlier. If you want change, you have to be the change that you want to see. So you alone cannot go out and vote. You must take your friends, you must take your neighbors, you must take your family members, and not accept the excuse that I ain't never voted and I ain't going to start now because I ain't in politics. Well, guess what? Politics affects all of us because if you pay taxes, you're giving us your money and you're telling us what to do with it. And I ain't met many of you that's just going to give you your money and say do what you want to do with it. So make sure we get people to go out and vote because this CRT that they're trying to push is real and they got somebody running for every position on the school board. And if you haven't opened your eyes, they're running in your area too because they're trying to make changes that's going to affect you and me. And we need to change that. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Dane, Mr. Yes. Dane, I just want to add that um, I just hate that the first question that Reverend Gray asked, that he said the House and the Senate, that all of them didn't get a chance to speak to it. Because you can talk about all this stuff, but if you don't have broadband, education, the workforce, and all that, we're going to be set behind. Mm -hmm. So I would have loved to hear it from my uh, senator over here and my House rep over here. Yes, stand on it. Right, their stance yes. on it because that's for me. Like I said, it sure be the thing. That's number one broadband because it touches every aspect of what we do. Okay. And, and if another pandemic comes through, they won't learn nothing. Somebody else had a question. Yes, sir. I'm gonna change. Don't here. forget, uh, Davis, over because he's been holding his hand up for the long. Okay. I need to. I mean, this is the end of the and This is a medical problem. Question I'm ready to ask. May not be up you can do anything about it, but I want to ask anyway. What is being done on a local level in, in North Carolina to help seniors? I'm a senior. My wife retired. I'm retired. My wife had a stroke. I'm two dollars from being unaccepted and one dollar from being in the poor house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think don't make enough here, but one dollar over is too much. And I can't get no help. I'm going, I'm going broke. What is being done on a local level to understand that people need help? I mean, I see seniors dying in North Carolina. They're literally dying. Yes. Thank you for that question. And I get tired of people saying, well, we just need access to help here. I've got access to McDonald's. But if I don't have the money in my pocket to be able to go and order something and pay for it, do I really have access to McDonald's? We need health care, plain and simple. And what we need to do for our seniors, we need to make sure we protect Social Security, but we also need to make sure we are protecting Medicare and expanding that health care to include, because as we get older, we need more help with our eyes, we need help with our hearing, and we need dental help. So part of answering that, that question is why I am fighting for improvements in Medicare. I'm fighting for universal health care because health care is a basic human right. And every one of us deserves to be able to afford life-changing medication and procedures and even if we can't pay for it. I am the candidate in this race who, who had the strongest fight to expanding Medicaid in North Carolina. Expanding Medicaid would have covered 500,000 North Carolinians, 500,000 North Carolinians, many of whom who work, but 
But even with the job, it is hard to be able to pay insulin when it's gone from $6 to $18 and more than that in one year. Everything is costing more, and um, that is why I'm fighting for universal health care through fixing what's broken with ACA. But I believe that we should have Medicare for all, and that's health care for everyone. And we need to be able to put the prescription drug prices, we need to lower them as well. And last but not least, we need to make sure that we are providing for the care that our seniors need in terms of in-home health care. And we need to make sure that there are appropriations for that. We did it during COVID. We were able to cover many medical services. Did, did anybody have to pay to get a test? Did anybody have to pay for your vaccination? So if we can do that during COVID, one of the worst pandemics in the world, why can't we continue to take care of sick folk? There you go. Shut up, Davis. Thank you so much for the question. Specifically, as it pertains to seniors, I would agree that we need to continue to look at um, reforming Medicare. Um, but I want to be very plain spoken here. North Carolina needs and needed to expand Medicaid yesterday. I mean, we are one of the few states in this nation that's still playing games. And this, this is why we are here. Elections have consequences. And the Republicans felt it was a mandate that they didn't have to do it. Now, I can tell you what I've been up to. I've been fighting on this issue for years. As a matter of fact, uh, Representative Willingham, we were one of the conferees, he could tell you this. When it came down to this budget, we were doing everything under the sun, trying to go ahead and push uh, uh, Medicaid expansion. At the end of the day, we got a provision that actually put in place a Medicaid legislative study commission. And that commission now is coming back to bring recommendations in a short session. So I'm being uh, cautiously optimistic, but this issue is about getting our residents out to vote in the election after election after election. And I want to come back to something real quick, Reverend Gray, because this is the answer to your original question. It was the Democrats that put in place the ENC authority that really began to shape broadband and, and where we were trying to head in the state. I know about it. how I was there. Governor Easley appointed me on the ENC authority. What happened when uh, things changed in Raleigh and Republicans went into the majority? The first thing they cut was the ENC authority. And what they went on to do, Reverend Gray, was they created the two newest departments in the state which was the Department of Veterans, Military Veterans Affairs, and DIT, Department of Information Technology. The intent was to try to shift it to DIT, but DIT doesn't have the capacity to handle all this deployment. But now what they're realizing, and I'm sorry to say the truth here, is this has such far-reaching impacts, and especially in these rural areas. Watch this. You need this now to run your water system. Farmers, they're using technology in a ways we've never seen. So now they're finally realizing you see the scramble that's going on, but the infrastructure is not there now because the election changed. That's why we are here and we must vote nonstop like we never before, even in a midterm where there's so much speculation that enthusiasm will be down. And matter of fact, put on top of that enthusiasm, the uh, uh, lack of enthusiasm, that some are going out of their way to deter and keep people home. Let me see if there's someone else. She, she had one. Anyone else? With your young man. Yes, sir. So my question is in regards to education. All you all mentioned having education somewhere in your platform. Um, I was wondering if you all could talk just in your respective roles about what your top priorities are in improving public education, um, just supporting the overall well-being of students. Uh, 
I'm going to talk for the educators because when uh, Cooper Suggs and, and Raymond Smith did it, uh, it's over. <laughs> so um, if we start looking for some of the top priorities first, we've got to make sure we pay our teachers. Because if we don't pay our teachers and then if we don't pay our bus drivers and our teachers' aides, we're not going to have anybody to teach our kids. I have been subbing since 2007. And I can tell you right now, we are struggling because teachers are quitting left and right. And so how are our kids going to get the basic foundation if we don't have the people to take care of that? So we need to make sure that we're paying them what should happen. That's the first thing. And then when we start looking at everything else as master's pay and, and all of that, we got to respect those people who have been raising all of us. And if they've done a great job with all of us, and I tell the legislator, oh, you went to school, they took care of you, when did it change all of a sudden that the teachers are no longer important? So that's the first thing that I would say. And then I'm going to say tag, and I'm going to let them finish it. <laughs> I would give everything that Representative Spears just said. And as an educator, we realize that, that changes must take place within the public school system. It's all right for charter schools we have. All the fun money that's going to the opportunity grants, those private schools. Private schools, all right. But if we're going to fund those, we must fund public education. And that's what's not taking place. It must be done because, like I said, children, students deserve, whether you're going to a private school that your parents may be paying 15000 a year for, a one that's 55000 a year for, our public school kids deserve the very same thing. And that's what we're going to have to fight for. And that's what all of us, everyone up here, we are court, but if we are in the minority, our voices are going to be silenced. So all of those young people, those teens, those millennials, those above 45 and over, guys, y'all, we need to get out there and vote. We have to do it. Sure. And my other point is very simple. My, my last point is this right here, is that in preparing our children for the workforce, when I say our children, I'm talking about our school students. In looking at the curriculum, we've got to be able to look at our curriculum so that the courses that we're being, that's being offered, I was a high school teacher, National Board Certified, Masters in East Carolina, and I love children, I love education. But we've got to have a curriculum just like the same type of courses being offered in those private schools, they've got to come to us. And if we do that, hopefully more of our children will, whenever they finish up, they will have that direction. Because right now we're losing them in around fourth grade. Absolutely. Okay, I, I just want to insert this, uh, something we haven't mentioned. Uh, one of my pet things that I'm working on is uh, behavioral health. And, and this is something that uh, Underlines, underlines a lot of the problems that's in our school system. We know that, well, the, the statistics say that one out of five every kid suffers from some kind of behavioral health problem, health issue. And that's something, what I'm trying to do is to try to make sure that every school system, especially in these here, has um, uh, day treatment in schools for behavioral health. Uh, in the West, Western part of the state, I mean, it's there, but for some reason, over here in the East, uh, we don't have it. We, we have it now. I've gotten it into Edgecombe County, uh, Bertie now, uh, Martin County, and also the Nash. But uh, this is something where a lot of us say can't teach because of the problems they have with kids, you know, their, their behavior. So one of the things that this will do, it, will, it helps. The teacher helps because they can't teach, they can't learn anything if they're not, if they're acting up or not in school or they deal with some problems that they can't solve themselves. So we're pushing, I'm pushing for this to be in every school. And it's something that can't happen because we in the legislature, we've already put money into the uh, MCOs and those organizations that have local uh, providers out there. And those providers provide that service in the school for free, and then I say it's free to the school, but it's being paid for because we've already given money to do that. So I think that will be something that will help in moving our students forward.
Yes, thank you um, for that question. And that's the, the, the reason why that's a very good question is because what we don't understand is the numbers here. This is, this is, this is um, and, I, and I don't know how many times I can say this to make it make sense. Local politics matter. Mm. Now, we don't have anybody in here from running for school board. We don't have anybody here running for county commission. But those are the people who absolutely make the decision mm -hmm. as to what goes on in your schools. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll give you a prime, a prime example. Um, we had a serious situation in Goldsboro um, just a few weeks ago where some students went to the city council and complained about the conditions in their school. It was absolutely atrocious. Okay? Well, it wasn't for lack of money. Me and other representatives who represents Wayne County, we counted $97 million that we sent to Wayne County. Through the, between the legislature and the federal government, our funds and, and other funds, there's approximately $97 million that Wayne County has for the education system. But it's the school board's decision and the county commission's decision to prioritize what goes on in these schools. So when we go to sleep on midterm elections, and right now we have four Republican school board members in Wayne County running for re-election, and not one Democrat is challenging them. So how dare we say anything about the decisions that they make? So again, we have to get involved. The other thing that I think we need to understand is this. These are the numbers behind this. There are approximately 1.5 million students in K-12 education in the state of North Carolina. And of that 1.5 million, approximately 52% of them are students of color or non-white. So the majority of students in our school system are not white. But approximately 80% of the teachers in the state of North Carolina are white. So who in the heck is teaching critical race theory? <laughs> it's not those white teachers, I promise you. And of those white teachers, it's overwhelmingly female. Okay? So we have to watch who's teaching our children. We have to encourage young people like yourself to get into education. Okay? Because it's an opportunity that they're begging for young blacks to get into. Okay? And so that we have a responsibility in all this. We, we're not going to be able to fix it up here. We, we can't fix it. We send the money. But when it gets to your community, it's your city, your, your, your county commissioners, and your school board who decides how it gets spent. So we've got to get involved in those races, too. Uh, Senator Smith spoke earlier to uh, how the, the money kind of the floodgates opened up when uh, COVID uh, had that began to impact communities. And uh, I know that I believe in 2021, the CDC uh, made a resolution acknowledging racism as a public health crisis. And so I'm wondering if any of that discussion made it to the state level and if that is a realistic vehicle to use to address some of these issues that are impacting our communities. Uh, thank you for that question. And um, let me share, first and foremost, we saw the systemic inequity when we saw the COVID pandemic. We saw which communities were the first to get the vaccinations, the first to get the tests, the first to get the tracking and tracing. And realizing that there was an equity problem from the very beginning, the conversations around the disparate impact for black and brown people were very much in my heart. When on March the 19th and 20th, when we had our first legislative session and a discussion about this, I demanded that they provide appropriations for medical providers who were serving, who were serving minority communities. Because at first, the Republican-led um, committee wanted to grant millions of dollars for testing, tracking, and tracing for members of the Old North State Medical Society. There are only 100 providers in the Old North State Society, and that wasn't enough to cover, especially in Eastern North Carolina. So I um, submitted a proposal for them to provide it for any healthcare provider who is serving in minority communities and so that $2 million appropriation to the Old North State grew to $60 million. Because if we don't advocate for us, who in the room is gonna advocate for us? 
We need to make sure that when you are hiring your next leader, you're going to hire those leaders who have a track record for working toward funding for those of us who have been underfunded and underserved for years and for decades, like Raymond Smith was fighting for HBCUs. East Carolina, North Carolina A&T, Elizabeth City, and thank you Don, and thank you Shelly, because we know that when we're in the room, we have to advocate for us. Along with that was the mental health that Shelly was talking about, those same appropriations, we were able to continue them following the 2021 discussion that you talked about, because we know when they get a cold, we get the flu and pneumonia in our black and brown communities. And so we fought for further appropriations and investments for mental health and for counselors in our school systems and um, to have that wraparound support and services. And if I could just get one minute to redirect on that other question from Pastor Gray. Um, when I was in the North Carolina General Assembly, my first session, my first term, 2015, I filed a piece of legislation that was called the Internet Superhighway. And in that internet superhighway proposal, it had us outfitting vans with hotspots. Because I, as a teacher now for 18 years in the public school system, I saw my students have to sit outside McDonald's or sit outside the library just so that they could have a hotspot to do their work. And so that pilot turned into a template that Governor Roy Cooper used when the pandemic hit to retrofit school buses with hotspots and internet technology and deploy them in every desert, internet desert in this state. So if you're proactive and you have the right strategy, it was that bill that um, got me selected as the joint chair of the Legislative Tech Caucus. And as the joint chair of the Legislative Tech Caucus, I looked at the Connect American funds. And what I looked at is that these telecom industries They've been giving millions of dollars to come into these rural areas and set up broadband. So Pastor Gray, why don't we have broadband? Because if we don't have a high enough population, they're not gonna invest in our communities. They're not gonna come and offer broadband. And so that's why we've gotta fight to get green light back. Because when green light was municipal broadband through Wilson and a public-private partnership, um, Brother Dancy and Macclesfield and other parts of Edgecombe County, we all had internet access because of the public-private partnership. And so that's why my platform includes that. And as the Joint Chair of the Legislative Tech Caucus, Senator Fitch is right. They tried to come in and give $15 million to Montreal. But what I did is I filed the amendment to divide that money up and give it to the strongest and one of the top national programs for cyber security, and that was Fayetteville State and Fayetteville Tech. And we divided that money out, and so that's why it got shut down, because I said, if you're not gonna give it to the HBCUs and these minority-serving institutions and these community colleges, then Montreal won't have it either. And so that's how that ended. It also led to 12 and six short-term workforce training programs. Let's just face it, everybody's not gonna to go to college, but we need CTE and short-term workforce training, and so that's legislation that I filed that provided 12 occupations that you can get in six months, and I'm looking at your future, young man. I am fighting to for counseling all student loan debt. Getting a college degree shouldn't confine you to a lifetime of debt, so we're taking care of you right now, we're taking care of you. We are down to the last few minutes of our discussion. Mr. Shelley, we will entertain before we ask. Okay, I just want to uh, give some information. The Legislative Black Caucus, uh, we discussed all this thing. That, that's what we were fighting as a group, the Legislative Black Caucus. And as a result of that, we have now in the Department of Health and Human Services an equity secretary. And our own Angela Bragg is undersecretary of that office. So they're the ones that are trying to make sure that we have equity when it comes to healthcare in our communities. So that was a result of that. So, so call Angela, and she got some people working for her to make sure that if you're having an issue dealing with uh, you know, healthcare, uh, you're thinking you're not getting the kind of service that you should, she's the one that can help you with that. So we do have a secretary of equity uh, equity affairs or something like that in the state right now, and Angela is under secretary of that department. Okay. 
Okay. We have about seven minutes we're supposed to be done. So we'll ask one question that was posed saying, um, if we are all here tonight, tell us, some of you have primaries, some of you have primaries in the room. And the question is, we want to know uh, in a uh, 90 second, I guess, or two minute push, why are we voting for you? We'll start with you, Pastor Gary. Thank you, Bishop. Um, and again, thank you for having all having me here and having all of us here. Um, leadership matters. It's real simple. Whether we're leading a church, whether we're running public policy or a corporation or a nonprofit, leadership matters. I think that we can have people that are public servants, or we can have people that want something from people and not what they want for people. I think you should vote for me because I've always postured myself to put people first. Because at the end of the day, people is what matters. Secondly, that we do everything in a principled way. And if we put people first and we do things in a principled way, then we will progress as a society. And so it's important that we elect people that walk amongst us, live amongst us, worship amongst us, interact amongst us, and really understand the real issues. And so I'm James Gale, I'm asking for your vote again in November. I don't have a primary. Everything you need to know about me is at jamesgaylier.com. All of my policy positions, all of my bills that I sponsored, there's actually no hidden secrets at all, jamesgaylier.com. Again, thank you for inviting me tonight, and it's a pleasure to uh, have met you, and hopefully I'll get to meet all of you before I leave tonight. The bottom line here is this. What is the best chance for the Democratic Party, body, uh, party to, to go forward in November and win this election for Senate District 4? I do not differentiate myself from Senator Fitch in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Uh, he and I primarily uh, we stand for pretty much the same thing. But this is about where are we going to go from here and where are our best chances to keep this seat in the General Assembly. And it's simple, it's as simple as that. I think that I have the best opportunity, get the best opportunity for that because of my familiarity with Wayne County and knowing that Wayne County is going to be the largest part of this district. This is our best chance to go forward. I offer up to you myself because I am a selfless leader. I've been uh, in, as part of selfless service for my whole life. And I have no problem sacrificing myself and putting myself up for this particular sacrifice. It's going to require a tremendous amount of effort and energy to go forward. And I have that and I need your support. Thank you. I'm the best man for the job. <laughs> It does not matter how large the district is, and it does not matter that there are more people who live in Wayne County than live in Wilson County. I have the experience. I know how to navigate the waters in the General Assembly. I've done it in the past. I will continue to do it in the future. I ask and vote for me. God bless you all. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. Um, I ask you to vote for me because I'm accessible to my constituents. I'm transparent about my work and I'm bold and brave enough to stand up and fight for the people of our area. So if you take away anything from what I've said today, just understand that my job is to make sure that I continue to put people first. And so I wanted to make sure that I stand up and fight for Edgecombe and Pitt counties. So vote for Candy Smith with a K, K-A-N-D-I-E, candysmith.com, look me up. And if you have any questions, please contact me. Thank you so much and I look forward to meeting you all.
she might be okay. I thought I yielded my time on the other side. <laughs> Set my time for 90 seconds. Thank you so much, sir. It would be the honor and the privilege of my life to be able to serve you as your next congressperson for the 1st Congressional District. In 2005, after organizing more than 120 pastors to lead us to Washington, D.C., and to fight for community development in these eastern North Carolina counties, Congressman G.K. Butterfield recommended me to the Congressional Black Caucus Leadership Institute. And it was at that Leadership Institute in 2005 that I worked my way up through every level of leadership from an assistant pastor in the community to a school board member, a North Carolina State Senator for three terms, and now um, a party officer getting Democrats elected up and down the ticket all over the state. I ran for U.S. Senate in 2020. While I did not win the primary, I won these 19 counties in eastern North Carolina. There's no one with a demonstrated record of keeping this seat blue. It's been blue since 1882, and we cannot allow that to change. I'm going to build on Congressman Butterfield's legacy. I'm going to get strong representation. I've been endorsed by more than 14 organizations who are bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars to make sure we have the resources we need to keep this seat blue. Last but not least, it's not about I have an opponent, it's just that I am the best or the first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief. Of course, this is home for me, so uh, I'm doing what I love to do, and that is represent the people of my district. And my philosophy while I'm there, and since I've been there, is that when you come to any vote, the first thing I consider is uh, my district. The second thing is state, and I'm last if it comes to that point. Uh, as I said before, I'm one who don't mind uh, you know, being the only one if I think that's the right way to go. And so I believe that I have been, as I said when I first ran, to everybody, I'll be the best House representative you've ever had. And I believe I've done that. And I will continue to be that. And I will continue to raise the level of expectation from the people in my district. So in November, when you are vote, of course, um, vote for Shelley Willingham, District 23. Thank you. Why should you vote for me? Because I feel that pre-K does matter, and that's the foundation of learning. And I understand people from all walks of life. I do not have an opponent. God answered my prayer. But I'm fighting right now to organize, to get out, to turn out the vote. Because even though my name is not on the ballot, you'll see my signs, you'll see me knocking on doors, and doing everything that must be done so that when we turn out the vote for the other persons on that ballot, including our judges, I realize that it's about people who will be sitting in those positions who understand the needs, the heart, who have a heart for people. And that's what this is all about. So remember April the 28th, the first day of early voting, and we were encouraging everybody to vote early. And May 17th was his election day. So that's the reason why I think you should vote for me. I want to thank the um, Eastern Alliance Bishop. Uh, thanks for the invite. And thanks for the dialogue in this course. My friends, this race for the first congressional district, which there has been a long history, legacy of service, uh, leaders such as Eva Clayton, Frank Bounds, G.K. Butterfield. To me, this is about protecting the seat. We have to protect the seat. There's so much focus on the U.S. Senate because of the 50 vote and then the uh, tie and then the vice president, but there's only about a five vote difference in the House. It's close and it's a critical midterm. But it's not just about protecting this seat. I'm looking you in the eye today. This is about, 
I'm a native of Eastern North Carolina. This is home for me. I only left mainly to go serve my country, and I came back. This is about transforming our region, not being left behind. It's unacceptable to not have our fair share. It pains me, absolutely pains me, to go to so many schools and hear our kids say they're leaving and they don't want to come back. We are better than this. That's a sense of hopelessness. This is about restoring, renewing hope and opportunity. And yes, we can do it together, and I ask for your vote in moving and transforming Eastern North Carolina. Thank you again, and God bless each and every one of you. I want to thank everybody as well, and uh, it's great to see all the candidates out. I'm excited, uh, and you ought to be, because we have a great group here, and uh, we need to support them, and I pledge uh, my support as we move through the campaign process. I appreciate all the work that you all do to make our lives better. Uh, very quickly, I was a judge in 2009, and uh, I will make a confession. Uh, being a judge is pretty comfortable, um, particularly if you don't do anything stupid or say anything stupid. And you, you know, you get to stay out of the public eye if you do that, and you're pretty comfortable. Uh, out of the clear blue sky, uh, one afternoon when I was going home, it was in May, I remember. Um, the DA at the time, I only had announced his return, and I got a call, um, surprisingly, from Governor Beverly Perdue. I didn't anticipate the call, I didn't see the call. And when I answered, uh, she said, Judge Evans, and I said, yeah, she says, this is your governor, I need for you to take this job. And uh, she said, um, I need for you to tell me, go home and talk to your wife, and tell me by 7.30 in the morning what you're going to do. Had a long sleepless night, but here's what I concluded. Uh, like the old folks used to say, I got a sign, that was a sign. And I told my wife, it wasn't so much uh, that I was worried about not having a job, but if I decided not to accept the governor's offer, how would I look at myself five or six years later in terms of the opportunity to do more than just what a judge does? And so I called her at 7 early the next morning and accepted the job. That's why you should vote for me, because I'm not finished. Um, we have diversified the office, both gender and race, almost sevenfold since I took office. We have instituted progressive policies. We have one of the most competent staffs in the state of North Carolina. Several of my people have moved on. I just talked to the United States Attorney for the Western District of North Carolina. <coughs> at the beach last week. She was one of my lawyers working for me as a salsa agent years ago. So you have a very competent staff, you have a progressive staff, and we have more work to do. I ask you to give me that opportunity and I thank you and appreciate your support. So, we pray and we hopeful that our attempt at bringing information has helped wanted to make sure that it was not the environment where folks were not able to hear from candidates and so we hope that that helped and we just ask that you will continue when we break tonight they are going to be around to talk to you and we just ask that you would take some time to even get more information if you have other questions I know there were a ton more but we didn't get to those and we could do that all night long but it's, it's eight, eight, almost 8.40 and we want to monitor our time. I will say, um, and, and um, Pastor Clint is going to come and close us in prayer. I will say there were comments and folks asking me as to, uh, and you all will have to somehow address this. Uh, we can't do it tonight. Why there are our own running against our own. Uh, those are questions that are being asked. Uh, so maybe the, you all can help clarify that in some of your conversations with people. Um, if uh, one of the things that was said is, uh, why, why, do, why do we as the community have to choose between two and those kind of things, what they meant by that, I 
can't clarify, but I just think that those are those are questions that stand in folks' mind. You know, why we have not been able to narrow down and decide so our community is united come election time. So we will just hope that you guys can help to clarify that you talk to the real constituency as we can we give our candidates a big hand as well? Ms. Latoya, they see you slide in and we didn't get to the devotion that we had moved past it. But thank you for pairing anyway. You got it? All right. Pray for us. Uh, Lord God, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, you said in your word, God, all authority is ordained by you. So, Lord, we ask that you would touch now. <laughs> Every candidate, God, that you would touch their hearts and their minds. Yes, Lord. Because, God, we do need leadership. Yes, Lord. And, Lord, you said in the last days, perilous times shall come. Yes, I believe that we're in those perilous times. Yes, Lord. Touch the hearts of every candidate. Yes, Lord. That, God, that they will see, God, what the people need. Yes. And then, God, I ask that you would touch the hearts of the voters. Yes. That we will vote our conscience. Yes. And that we will put the right person in the disposition. Yes. God, we pray as we leave this place that you protect us down the dangerous highway. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.